Greetings and shalom. This is Adrian Scott, and welcome to Truth and Testimony, the broadcast. It is time for another Bible break. Now, this is going to be, I think, maybe a real fun one. I've really been considering this for a while, and I've decided I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that is, I want to do a complete reading of the book of Genesis. So that is, of course, what we will start with in this particular video is Genesis chapter one. Um, but over the period of time, I'm going to make my way through the entire book. Now, before I get into anything else, um, normally I'm not a big one for name dropping, but in this case, I'm going to do so. Uh, one of one of the most profound teachings that I ever interacted with is from one of my absolute favorite Hebrew roots teachers. Um, he's really, when I, when I first started considering Hebrew roots and, and the messianic movement, um, this is the first guy that I really started checking out. And I, I have followed him ever since. Sadly, uh, we did recently lose him in the last number of years. Um, but uh, I absolutely think this is a case of someone who is, uh, when he's standing before the Father, is going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I really believe that. And his name uh, was Brad Scott. And he did a series. And the reason I'm mentioning this is if you ever really want to get hardcore, like in-depth, you need to check this series out. Um, he, he takes you through the Hebrew to English of Genesis chapters one. I believe it was chapters one through four. But he pretty much just about goes through word by word translation for all four of those chapters. It is like a, oh, I can't remember, like a 30 disc series or something like that. It is very in-depth, very, very in-depth. But if you really want to get some serious meat going on, I would encourage you to check out his Bereshit series, Bereshit, which translates as uh, In the Beginning or Genesis um, by Brad Scott. So with that being said, uh, I will move into my own reading here. I am um, very happily going to be reading from my new addition to my family, which is I just picked up. One thing I did not have, I had that. Uh, you might have seen it if you've watched some of my previous videos, my enormous white old King James and Bible version of the Bible. And um, it was like 10 pounds the, but yet somehow the, the text was not very easy to read. And it was the older, older style of English, which made it um, difficult when, when you're not used to that, it made it difficult to read at times. So I got, it's still the, I guess what technically would be the 1769 uh, King James version of the scriptures. But this is for, you know, us older folks. It is um, large print, very easy to read thin line so it's not doesn't weigh a ton and that is what i'm going to be doing the book of genesis from is my king james version of the bible so having said that i will do my sort of customary take on it which is i'm just going to go ahead and read chapter one here and then i will go back and and comment at a few points all right now that i can see what i'm doing let's let's read genesis chapter one in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, 
and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree-yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So there is Genesis chapter 1. There's actually quite a few things that I'd like to go back on. The first one goes right back into verse 1. (laughs) Um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the first thing is, and this one ties into, we'll call this a little mini Hebrew lesson. So in Hebrew, that opening line is, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. And so that very first word, that's actually where you get the name of the book, Bereshit. And it translates as in the beginning. Um, in it, We know it as, as Genesis. But the, the, the literal translation of it is in the beginning. What is so fascinating about that is the first two letters of that first word are a bait in Hebrew 
and an aleph in Hebrew. So the bait, now, uh, if you've watched any of my Hebrew stuff, you, you may have seen some explanation of this, but each letter in Hebrew had, really has, a pictographic form. It's it's changed quite a bit. The modern Hebrew is not the way Hebrew used to be. There is a step back from that is what they call Paleo Hebrew. But a step back from that, uh, you get into different um, variations and there's debate over sources of different stuff. But it's a, a, a Proto-Sinaitic, um, Semitic, Proto-Semitic version of it. And that one really is the full picture version where it's literally images representing the characters in the paleo those images became more resembling of letters but you could still kind of identify some of the images and then in the modern it's really uh, changed quite a bit so you really don't see it in the modern Um, if you want to kind of look at what i'm talking about go look for those ancient forms just look at the different forms of hebrew you'll see it and when you see the pictures you'll know that's the right one but in that pictographic version the letter bait um, meant a foundation or a floor plan um, or a house, the foundation of a house, basically. And then the letter Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet, is an ox head uh, representing might or authority um, and used more specifically as a representation of God. So what you have, and, and it goes deeper than this, and this is the stuff that Brad Scott talks about in his lengthy series, but that those first two letters basically are representative that God is the foundation. He is the house upon which everything is built. Right there, first two letters, first word of the Bible. And I just always thought that was quite profound. Um, Now we get into one where this could potentially be one of those examples of a bit of a mistranslation. So in the King James, they defined it as heaven. The Hebrew word is shamaim. Now, another brief Hebrew lesson. Um, Hebrew basically starts with a parent root, and then you can add various prefixes or suffixes to the word, which means all of the words that with those extra stuff on it still have the same parent root, but those individual words can translate as different things. What you'll find is when you have the same parent root, often there'll be some commonality between those words. Um, But having said that, I digress. One of the rules in Hebrew grammar is in the suffixes, they have something to denote. Now, Hebrew does still use masculine and feminine. There's a bunch of other languages that do that. I'm French Canadian. Um, French still has that. They've got masculine and feminine in their um, dialogue. So different words will fall into one of those two categories. Same thing in Hebrew. When you have a masculine word and it's going to be in plural, um, the ending is im. It sounds out as im. And when it's uh, a female, when it's a feminine word, the ending is at or ot for plural. Um, so an example might be for that one, um, torot, right? So that's the plural of Torah. So Torah is an instruction. Torot, therefore, is instructions. So shamaim has, is a masculine word and it has the masculine ending. So I would think the more accurate way to translate that is heavens, because it is a masculine plural, im. Yet they've defined it as a singular, heaven. So that's just one little example of stuff that can come up. I still think it doesn't discount anything from the King James Bible. There's some real advantages to the King James Version. Um Although they have covered up and added some stuff, they've generally done it in a format. An example of that is whenever you have the name of God, yud heh vav they'll replace it with the word, generally with the word Lord, but they'll do it all in capital letters. So if you're ever reading that King James and you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, you know that the Hebrew behind that is yud heh vav the name of God. Um... That's, you know, one example of that. Another one is if they 
at times um, added words for clarification of meaning or stuff like that. But the, that word itself was not in the source material. Then the word they added, they would do so in italics. So when you see any word in italics, it's something that the King James translators added generally for clarification. So that's a couple of things that make the King James a good version. But this is one where I, I wish they would have translated it as heavens. And I almost wonder, there's, there's a concept, and it mostly, so far as I know, ties around the word Elohim, of something they call a majestic singular, because Elohim it talks about God, right? Literally, it translates as mighty ones. Um, so you see, if you read through the book of Judges, there's times when the judges themselves are called Elohim, mighty ones. Um, there's other kings are called Elohim. You know, there's different times where different things are called Elohims. I think there's even an example of some cities being called Elohim, mighty ones. Um, but it is also used for God. And in that case, um, they're doing it as what they call the majestic singular. So although it's a plural suffix at the end of the word, im, um, they're making it singular. I, number one, would argue maybe it is still plural because could we be talking about the effectively the triunity of God, right? You have God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, that that's more than one. That's plural. So therefore, Elohim would apply as a plural. But I'm that's just me um, making a guess, okay? Anyways, they did it as heaven. So that's one little thing I did observe. Uh, one thing I really liked about this is, and this ties into the idea of, of old earth and young earth creation, because there is old earth creation, and that introduces things which I've talked about previously, like the day age theory or the gap theory that have to introduce a long periods of time to make up for the billions of years that evolution says there is. When a plain, literal reading of the Bible properly, in my opinion, denotes six literal days of creation, and then the seventh day he rested. Um, there's the language behind it. Yom is a day. It's not a period of time. It's a day. And to clarify it, and I like what the King James do here, when they get to it, they, trend, they render it out as, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So they're saying evening, morning, that's a 24 hour period, right? The first day, the second day, the third day. So that's one thing I've always appreciated about the King James. Um, another interesting one, and there's a different theories that tie into this about the idea of uh, firmament dividing the waters from the waters, that there was waters above the firmament and waters beneath the firmament. One of the theories of that is that um, there may have been, and this is a theory, but there may have been a canopy of ice surrounding the planet, frozen water. And that the benefits of that, it would have created this incredible like hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So the atmosphere would have been super oxygen rich. This, things could have grown lived longer with less damage, grown bigger, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of advantages to it. They have actually done some experiments growing food in um, like hyperbaric oxygen chambers and uh, or something close to that. And the results were pretty staggering. These enormous pumpkins and tomatoes and stuff that just were like, that can't even be from Earth, you know, but they were. And that's the advantage of doing that. So it's totally a theory. It would have given some real benefits on the surface of the planet. And that when the flood happened, um, the fountains of the deep burst open, the water started bursting up and that causes a thermodynamic reaction with all this friction in the atmosphere, which would have heated the atmosphere up that could have melted that ice canopy, which then came down that water plus the stuff burning up plus the rain. That's what flooded the planet. Um, all theory, but that's one thing. And one person that talks about that in a lot of detail, and it makes a lot of sense whether he's right or wrong. He at least makes it plausible. He makes it make a lot of sense is Kent Hovind. And he's got a seminar series. Uh, I believe that particular one was called The Hoven Theory. So if you're interested, I really would recommend you check that out as well. It is available online. There's numerous places you can get it from. If you just look for Kent Hovind 
the Hovind theory. Um, and check that one out. That was a, a big change for me. Another one I'll mention real quick, since I'm now in dropping name mode here, is Answers in Genesis. They do uh, some great teachings on the book of Genesis here. Um, that's the kind of the foundation of their, their ministry, Answers in Genesis, that the book of Genesis as the beginning of the Bible is the foundation for the rest of the Bible. If you discredit it, if you change the meaning of it, if you usurp it in any way, it causes the rest of the Bible to collapse. You have to have that foundation. So it's no surprise that in our world, which is not of God's world at the moment, there's such a strong and pronounced attack on those early books, in particular Genesis in the Bible. And this is the stuff that Answers in Genesis talks about. So they got any number of videos that touch on that kind of topic, including the days of creation and things like that. So that's another really good source to check out. Another one is on the, at the end of each day, he makes a comment that as he looks at what was created that day, he says, it was good. And each day it's, it was good. But you notice at day six, man is created. Now all of that is done. And he makes the comment of in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Tov me'od. This is the only time throughout all the days of creation that he says very good. And I think that connects to the idea of completeness, right? He's all about completeness, not having things half done or whatever else, right? It's, it's about the finished package. Like the, the idea behind Shalom is it, it, the simple translation of it is peace, but really, why is it translated as, why does it translate as peace? What, what are we talking about when we say peace or shalom that way? And I heard someone explain it one time and they said, because what it really means is lacking nothing. Everything that needs to be there to make it whole and make it work is there, present and accounted for. It is lacking nothing. It is complete. It is at peace. Shalom. So... When they say Shabbat Shalom, lacking for nothing when you get to that holy day. There's a line in here, which there's, um, there's a group of people in the world today that would not be big fans of this one. And it was verse 27. And I'm just going to point it out real quick. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. And here's the kicker. Male and female created he them. Well, in a modern world where they say there's any number of genders, um, this kind of flies in the face of that. But me personally, my opinion, that's just another ta attack on the validity and veracity of God's word when he said male and female created he them. So they're of course going to come and say, nah, it's not just male and female. It's all this other stuff too. Anything to usurp the authority and validity of God's word, in particular in the book of Genesis here. There's also that concept that uh, God, ble in verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Two things to point out in there. Number one, be fruitful and multiply. So, we talk about different sins and there's many of them. One of the things that comes up as a sin in the Bible is homosexuality. I don't know that that's necessarily one of the more egregious sins that you can do. They're all sins. and Really, there's no degree of sins. The reason I say that is when I read my Bible, when I go through the whole thing, Old Testament and New, the thing that I keep seeing coming up over and over and over again, that God says, don't do this, don't do this or else, don't do this or else, over and over and over again, in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writings, it keeps coming up. This really seems to be the one that stands out to him the most, or maybe the one that we're guilty of the most, and that is following after other gods that we have not known, that gods we have made with our own hands that are not gods whoring ourselves after those gods. That seems to me like that's one of the worst, right? 
don't do what they do and say you're doing it for me. It is an abomination. Deuteronomy. Right? So that's the biggest one there. But I heard someone say one time, they said, well, what makes homosexuality a sin? And I thought that the answer was brilliantly simple. And it just ties into that concept right there. Be fruitful and multiply. Gay couples cannot reproduce life. They cannot produce life. That's not to say they can't nurture life. That's not to say anything else. But just biologically, they cannot produce life. They can be artificially inseminated. They can donate sperm. They can do all kinds of stuff. But they themselves within that union cannot produce life. So before I put my foot any further in my mouth, I'll stop there. But that's an observation there. And then the last one is, get ready for it. I hate to disappoint y'all out there. We're all vegans. (laughs) We're all supposed to be vegans. Every plant in the field, every seed yielding fruit that produces after its kind, that was what was food for us. And I joke around about that, but that's what it says. That's what was intended. Now, it's interesting because we do get to a point There's a couple things I will say about this, and then I will wrap up this video. Uh, The first one is, I believe that man has done such a great job of corrupting the ground and corrupting what we grow in the ground that the fruits and vegetables and herbs and seed yielding fruits are not now what we had back then. And by extension, you cannot get the proper nourishment and nutrients and vitamins and minerals and everything else that you need the way that you used to. Um, And one potential evidence of that could be after the flood when they first come off the ark, because it is at that time that God says, okay, now I have made meat available for you to eat. It is okay to eat meat up to that point, up to that point, up to the point of Noah loading everything on the boat Everybody was eating plants or they were supposed to be eating plants and all that stuff, at least by God's reckoning. And it wasn't until after disembarking. And I think there's a reason for that because they needed time for plants to start growing again, right? Everything had just been destroyed by the flood. Um, But through that corruption and the destruction of the world and just the fall of the world, and as time went on, it got worse and worse and worse that the the health the healthy aspects of all of those plants and seeds and and fruits and veggies and all that stuff got diminished i think maybe some cases nowadays to almost nothing um and we're looking at genetically modified food that isn't even you know legitimately what it is it's been combined with something else to increase shelf life or to make whatever other changes they want to make so that they can, you know, have a, uh, be able to, to ship this stuff out and sell it annually because most fruits and veggies are not annual. They, they grow and bloom in certain parts or certain times of the year rather. Um, so there's changes like that. And then there's just a, dis- a diminishment of the quality of the soil and a use of different chemicals. Some have changed, some we're not using anymore, but the damage has been done And, uh, so yeah, well, I just, I don't know, I guess maybe what I'm trying to say in a very simple form is I don't know that you can be vegan. I don't think you can diet that way anymore, at least not without some kind of supplementation. Um, I have a friend, um, actually my friend I went to Israel with there, he is a vegan, but he also observes, um, non, no genetic modifications, um, no chemicals. It, it needs to be as clean and unpolluted as it absolutely possibly can be. Um, and, uh, you know, hats off to him because that is, he's taken that pretty hardcore and he's done, he's doing it. He's, he's sticking to it. So, you know, and yeah, I, I have a 
ton of respect for him for that one. My wife and I actually did the vegan thing for about a year and a half. And it just, it was so difficult to stay on top of it in the food prep and dealing with other members of the family. We just kind of let it lapse and didn't stick with it. But I will say when, when we did that for that year and a half, that was about the most energy we had. It was about the only time either of us had natural weight loss. Um, it, it really was a lot better for us. And I, I'd love to get back to there. It's just, again, it's so difficult in this world, especially with everything else we're dealing with. And, and yeah, you know, but I can appreciate it for sure. And I have my hats off to those that, that do it even in the modern world, because it's not easy. And, um, so yeah, but it's, it's just interesting that that's how it started. We were not to be eating meat. Right. And I think that connects to scriptural ideas of the lion laying down with the lamb and a baby would be among them. And I'm paraphrasing, but that idea that that uh, it was after they got off the ark that now the fear of man was going to be on all these animals and so on. But before that, it wasn't that way, that everything coexisted in peace, right, in this idyllic environment, possibly while there was still a canopy of ice, if that theory is true. Um. And that, yeah, it, it all changed by the fall and the sin of man. So do we need a savior? Yes, we do. Big time. And I think we keenly feel it nowadays when the world as a whole is about as ungodly as it's ever been. Um, right up there, right up there anyway. But I think I will wrap it up there. Genesis chapter one, we will continue the series and pick it up in chapter two. And that's where we learn about the Sabbath, about Shabbat. So you'll want to check back when that one comes out. In the meantime, I do thank you so much for checking out the video. If you stuck with it till this point, good on you. I give you a thumbs up. Now I ask the same from you. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up and feel free to share. Um, and again, I did mention those names, Brad Scott, his bare sheet series, um, Kent Hovind, The Hovind Theory, among other things that all these people have done, and Answers in Genesis, some really good resources where you'll get more information than you can get from me, because they're just more educated than I am. I'm just the schmo, just stumbling my way through this, and I appreciate you being here with me for the ride. Um, so blessings to you all in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. I wish you all a great week, and I do say shalom and bye for now.